Well, we've laid, we've laid some foundations, and I, I'm, I'm going to repeat just some of the, the key components uh, to summarize where we've been in terms of setting up a framework for design law and imposed law uh, based on the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. Uh, and then we want to take some of the implications of this into other areas that I think that you'll find very interesting. And I will share some of my own journey in thinking about the implications of these things, precept upon precept, because that's what we're told to do. Once the precept comes clear, you need to follow that precept through the scripture and see where it will take you, line upon line, line upon line. But before we do that, let's pray. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, it's a joy to be able to come before you boldly in the name of Jesus, our wonderful Savior. We pray that you would send your spirit to guide us, to be our teachers, to enlighten our minds, that we may see all the fullness of your goodness, mercy, and grace towards us, and that truly you are love, and in you is no darkness at all. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I began in the last presentation talking about some of my own experience in the performance kingdom, forming a name, having been given a name, and then actually wanting to live up to that name by my works and by my achievements and my performance, uh, thus proving that by nature uh, that I have bought into the lie of Satan that uh, you have a life in yourself and you must develop that and be good by or be valuable by what you do rather than who you belong to. And of course, I mentioned I inherited the name Evans, but when my grandfather said to me, remember you are an Evans, that I felt the need to live up to this name by what I do rather than simply inheriting uh, the name and living in that name. So you remember we talked about, and maybe I should... I can uh, take some of this down. We can redraw these things. That when, when you are buying into this lie of the serpent, you shall not surely die. This shifts our identity of our, who we are in relationship to God. One of the ways that I like to express this is the uh, story of what is understood to be two ships in the night, two uh, ships are coming and the, the US naval destroyer is coming up to this other light and you know the story where it reports on the, on the, uh, the communication system, divert your course 10 degrees to the south uh, and the light from the other side responds negative, change your course 10 degrees to the north. And of course, the, uh, the commander of the ship takes the, uh, the uh, communication device and says, I, this is the USS whatever, and he starts listing off, and I am the commander of this ship, and if you do not move, there's going to be consequences. And uh, the, the other person responds and says, this is the lighthouse, your call. <laughs> so when the... When the uh, the naval officer understood the identity of the light. It changed his relationship. You see, this is, this is the, all of us have fallen into this, this understanding that Satan has convinced us that we have life in ourselves and in subtle ways and in all of our culture and our practices, whether we, whether we profess to believe it or not. Our whole culture is wrapped up in this way of thinking, of independence. And you see this, and I, I, I marvel, and my father tells the same story, that how I, I would just run off and run away and do my own thing as a small child. And when you think about all the dangers that are out there, what makes you think that you can live independent and just do your own thing and disobey your parents? Where does this come from? It is the product of a belief system that we can live independently. And to go through teenage life without the counsel and wisdom and instruction and broken-hearted experiences of our parents and be forced to relive them again and again and again because of this spirit of independence. Wouldn't it be wonderful if children could just learn from the mistakes of their parents? 
<laughs> but then when they see, they see us who are parents uh, and we are living with the consequences of our choices and they see all the, our weaknesses as a result, they point to those things and, and uh, well, we don't need to listen to you. And then they repeat the same mistakes that we make and end up in the same position so that their children will do the same thing to them. And all this is stemming from the lie, you shall not surely die. And this is the, the point, as I mentioned, this is the Spanish edition of the book Life Matters. I took that precept of the lie of the serpent, you shall not surely die, and just followed through its consequences for all of the major teachings of Scripture. And that's what we, we put together in, in this particular volume. But I was led to this from the principles, as I said, in this booklet, Identity Wars, or book, Identity Wars, which is how do we obtain value? Where do we, what makes us valuable? And when I happened upon that verse, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It was revealed to my mind by the Spirit of God that this was a value system. That Christ himself was obtaining his value not by his position, not by his performance, not by his achievements, but simply by resting in the Father's word concerning himself. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Christ had took the opportunity to simply believe his Father's word and in believing that word, Christ became the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm making a connection here, okay? How did he become Lord of the Sabbath? That place of rest in the bosom of the Father where he does not have to prove to anybody about his pedigree as the divine son of God. He does not have to assert his authority and smash uh, the nations that refuse to submit to him. He has no feeling of inferiority, no fear, no concern because his father has defined for him who he is. He is the son of the living God. And as we read in John 6, 57, I live by the father. Beautiful. And even, as he says, that you might live by me. So in accepting his identity from the Father, letting his Father define who he is, Christ is both the author of faith and the Lord of the Sabbath. This is an important principle that we need because we're connecting a whole lot of points together on this. Because where does Christ dwell? John 1, 18. In the, in the bosom of of the Father. He does not stride out on his own. He does not have any, he did not have any adolescent experience of proving his independence from his Father. I do always those things which please him. He has no desire to break out of and form his own identity. You know how people say, I just need to go and find myself. <laughs> and you get lost. Go and lose yourself in the world and all that the world has to offer to, to find yourself. And this is where I was led down this path and I was uh, just amazed at the text, John, um, Proverbs 17, 6. Children's children are the crown of old men and the glory of children is their father. Interesting, earthly father. And now I began to connect this sense of value. What is it that defines my value? What if it, and I, I remember that I went to a website called imissmydad.com. People pouring out their hearts about their fathers having passed on. And story after story where children are saying, Dad, I wish you were here and that I could, I could just tell you that you could see the things that I'm achieving, the things that I'm doing, that I might have, you know, a word from you. Because it doesn't matter what you achieve and what you perform. What defines its value is your father. He is the one that defines its value. Until he puts his blessing on it, it has no blessing. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? You can tell yourself all you like, well, what I've done is good and what I have done is marvelous. But there's always that nagging doubt. Maybe someone else can do it better. Maybe they can do it more wonderfully than I can do it. But when the father says, son... I'm well pleased. This is a delight to me. In the relational kingdom, in the design law system, 
That's what feeds the soul, the father's blessing upon the actions of the child is what creates value. We do not have the capacity to create our own value. We only have the capacity to receive value by a living word. That's a big statement. A living word accepted by faith. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And that's where, as I said, my journey began when my father in heaven came to me back in 2001 and he, <coughs> he said to me, through the experience of the birth of my first son, he said, I don't want anything to come between you and me and I just want you to know me. And I had that tremendous wrestle. I had to, I had to, I had to give up my old value system of being valuable what I achieve and what I perform. You are offering me an intimate relationship with you. Simply, all I have to do is accept that I'm your son through Christ. And all that value is mine. I am beloved of the Father, the one that made the heavens and the earth and all the universe. Beloved of the Father. How? By faith. Simply believing the Word of God. And it was a tremendous wrestle for me as the dross of this old life system, of the old wine skin, the old wine that I had been partaking of as I'm detoxing from this hangover of what I've been taught. And I accepted this. And everything has changed from that, that point forward in terms of how we've gone. So, and we mentioned one other thing, and I just want to repeat this point in tying that remember the cycle, we talked about the cycle, that when you believe you have life in yourself, you are on this cycle of achievement and performance, which leads to the cycle of pride and depression. Because when you're achieving, you have value, and that leads to pride, because when you achieve and you perform, and it has come from you, then you have pride. And when you fail, well, then you have, to, you have the inverse of pride, which is depression. And this cycle, and of course, as you're going down, you have anxiety, and as you're going up, you have ambition. And this cycle which is, I connected into the uh, Elijah message, uh, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He will uh, lift people out of the valleys and bring down the mountains, raise the valleys to make a path for our God. It is the spirit of pride and it is a spirit of depression that prevents the spirit of God coming into the heart. Now, I'm just summarizing here. Uh, I'm just going really, really quickly because I want to move on to the next part. That this is what God is doing in the message of Elijah to, to raise the valleys and to bring down the mountains. And how does he do this? What was the message of Elijah? Behold, I will send you Elijah for the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall do what? Turn the hearts of the children to their fathers. And fathers to their children, for what purpose? That they might receive the word that says, you are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. That raises the valleys and drops the mountains and it prepares a way for the Lord. The Elijah message is intimately connected to this. But you have to give up the lie of inherent life source. And you'll notice... That this was the next step for me that led to the next part of the journey is that once I understood that the equality, and remember we looked at the text, Philippians 2 6, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and what made him equal with the Father? It was his knowledge of the Father, his knowledge of his character, that he knew the Father as the Father knew him. John 10:15. The the power, the omnipotence, the strength. The intelligence, all of that was given to him. So that's not where the value is coming from. That was freely bestowed upon him, for which he was immensely grateful to the Father and which creates the agape. But we go from that point, as we look at um, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation because... He is not afraid for his value. He's able to give away. He is able to, to come down and come down and to let others speak negative about him without, without worrying what other people think. And this is the great challenge for us, isn't it? That when people speak ill of you and they treat you badly, 
the irritation, the annoyance that comes up within the soul as a consequence uh, of that. And uh, so we now want to, we, we, what we did then, of course, was we looked at the lie. I just want to redraw this in terms of that God has life. And of course, this life is not just, we talked about the fact it's not just existence. It's, um, it is the words that he speaks of blessing. It is the blessing, the fellowship that this life is encompassed that in this model, uh, man is completely dependent on God to receive this life. He has no life in himself. In the model that Satan has suggested, he is suggesting, yes, God has life, but he has given to man to have life in himself. Now, there's different variations of this, of course. We talked about New Age, where we are divine and we are God and we have life simply because of the fact we are God. The Western Christian formula was that uh, God gave life to man. And then the only alternative after that is atheism, which was we're only here for a short period of time, and then an oblivion, That's, which is really an interesting uh, situation. So by having this life, this concept of life in ourselves, our identity is shifted. Our perception of ourselves in relationship to the lighthouse changes where we, as having life in ourselves, can actually mirror back to God and we can ascend into heaven and be like the Most High because we have life, God has life, He's just a bigger life source than us uh, and we could dare to say to Him to move 10 degrees rather than us moving 10 degrees because we have a false concept of our identity and his identity, our, our identity in relationship to him. Does that, does that make sense? So what we then looked at was the, the idea that the Ten Commandments, when, once we introduce the Ten Commandments, in this system of having life in yourself, for God to, in, to say anything to you in terms of directing you or offering you guidance must be considered as something that is imposed upon you. Because if you have life in yourself, if you have existence of your own, anything that God would say to you is imposition. Do you ever find that when, when uh, you can think of as a ch from a child's perspective, when your parent is offering you guidance, do you welcome it? Do you, do you look for it? Or is it a bit of a, you know, I, 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 I'm old enough. I can look after myself. I don't need you to tell me what to do. I have a brain. I know how to think. Stop telling me what to do. This is familiar, familiar territory. And, and uh, this imposition, this, this thought of imposition that's existing within this, this system, all stemming from the lie, you shall not surely die. Now, there's one other point we made, and we just want to repeat this issue. Seventh-day Adventists do not believe in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. So how can we be buying into this lie of inherent life source? What did we say on that point? you remember? Trinity. Through the Trinity. Through the Trinity. Why? Because as we look at the Son of God within the Trinity, the Son of God has life from Himself. He didn't inherit it from His Father. So He is a completely independent, self-sufficient life source, having life original, unborrowed, and underived from anybody. And by looking at this, we obtain a pseudo-doctrine of the immortality of the soul. It, it creates the same effect. Whether you believe in the doctrine of the immortality of the soul or not, if you believe in the Trinity, through the doctrine of Christ not having an inheritance, then you end up with the same effect. You see, this, this, is, this, is, this is why I began to wonder, why is Adventism being affected by, the, by all the same things as those who believe in the immortality of the soul, or many of the same things, without actually believing in the immortality of the soul? It's the doctrine of the Trinity. That's what led us into that situation. Also, the understanding that the Spirit has life in Himself and is a separate 
separate entities. Yeah. It goes right along with that because now the lifting up of the spirit is becoming greater than the Father and the Son. Yeah, I'll have to repeat that. I'll repeat that for him. Also, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit having a separate existence uh, and in intelligence and entity outside of the Father and the Son speaks of that independence, that same, same principle. So both of those lead you in that direction. It is a masterpiece of deception uh, to lead you in that direction. And so what we're looking at with this shift in life source, which we, we're talking about in, in this book here, and we begin the, the journey with the value system in, in this book here, Identity Wars, we are, uh, this was the way I ex explained that I called it the two kingdoms, the relational kingdom and the performance kingdom. They're the labels that I put on these two systems, which I were, was also using for the terms old covenant and new covenant. The old covenant is performance kingdom, the new covenant is a relational kingdom, okay? Now, I've attached to that the terms imposed law, design law, because they're terms that other people are familiar with that tap into this same uh, understanding. Uh, and it, an imposed law only comes about when something is being, you have your own life and it's being imposed upon you. So the implications for this are, uh, I began to think about the relationship of God and his son. And this is what opened up something very interesting to me. If the equality of the son is found in his relationship with his father and not in his own power. See, this is the problem that we have with the, the Trinity model is that the equality is based in power which means they are always side by side. They always, if, if one became subordinated to the other in position, that would immediately affect their value. And so they cannot be subordinated. One cannot be subordinated to the other except for the purpose of demonstration. Jesus steps down and he becomes a human to demonstrate humility, to demonstrate all of these things, but that's not who he really is. Does, does that make sense? So he can demonstrate submission without actually having a framework of submission. This is coming to imposed and design. The design of this is not submission. There's no submission in the system. But once, once I understood that Christ is not equal with the Father based on power, I could then conceive of him being in a position of submission to his Father. Okay? That, and that allowed... That allowed for the development of the idea of the divine pattern. Okay, this was the step-by-step -step process that we were following. The divine pattern. That the Son is the magnification of the Father. The Son receives, He is the express image of the Father, as it says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. He, he is the brightness of the Father's glory. He is a magnifier of the Father's glory person. And this, the divine pattern only becomes possible when you give up this performance-based value system. Because before that, my great concern when I was studying out the question of the Trinity was, yeah, but if Jesus is begotten of the Father, then, you know, then he he's, has less value. And that does, that does damage to the atonement because you see that line of thinking? Because then he's an inferior being and that makes the, the sacrifice of Christ inferior. And this, this is what the church teaches. And that was my concern at the time. But when I saw that, that Christ's value is not in his power, it's in the relationship that he has with his father, that he then could be in a subordinate position and still be equal. Okay? And this becomes very important because of the relationship that exists between a man and his wife. Because we were made in the image of God and his son. Okay? So if we have this pattern of the Trinity, then our marriage must be operating on the same pattern of co-equality based on power, position and performance. It's intellect for intellect, 
mind for mind, strength for strength in some cases. <laughs> and that creates a lot of tension, doesn't it? A lot of tension. But in the divine pattern, if we were made in their image, and we look at, we'll just look at a few verses on this, and we've touched on this in, in uh, Life Matters, but also in the book Return of Elijah. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it says in verse 7, these are challenging verses living today. <laughs> for a man eat, or indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. That's a challenging verse in our culture, in our environment. The woman is the glory of the man. That's, isn't that male chauvinist? Isn't that arrogant? Um, members of my family from the past have said, Paul was a male chauvinist. The way he wrote, he treated women badly. Well, when you're operating in this system of equality, yes, of course, it's quite chauvinist. But in the other system of source and channel, it's a completely different system because Christ is the express image of the Father and the wife, and he is the glory of the Father and the woman is the glory of the of the man. It's a completely different system in which to operate in. And that really began to intrigue me in terms of this relationship that exists between the father and the son as a pattern for all other relationships. And maybe we better spend a bit of time on that right now. And we look at 1 Corinthians 8, 6. I'm just quickly going over some key points here, which hopefully most of you are familiar with. But we just want to, I just want to put all these things together. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, in terms of the relationship of God and His Son, it says, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things. And that word in the Greek is ek, uh, from which we understand as the word source or origin. Okay? One God, the Father, of whom are all things. And one Lord Jesus Christ, the word in the Greek is dia, which means channel. And you can look this up in the Strong's. These are the words that uses the word origin and channel. I'll just change it to the word source. Source, channel. This is the pattern of this creation. This earth is based on a source and channel relationship. And everything within this creation works within this source channel system because we were made in the image of God. So God has made everything in this system source and channel. Okay, that has dramatic implications for how we live and move and have our being. And we look at other aspects of the relationship between the Father and the Son. I'm th and... Again, I'm just going quickly on this. Colossians 1.15, it says that Christ is the image of the invisible God. So the Father is invisible. The Son is visible. 1 Timothy 1.17, God immortal, invisible. God only wise. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.16 and 17, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. No man has seen God at any time, as it says in the book of John. The only begotten Son, He hath declared Him. He hath revealed Him. Invisible, visible. And as we see in Hebrews 1, 3, the Father has glory and the Son is the brightness. The brightness of the Father's glory. And these are the, the three main, there's other ones that I have in the booklet, The Divine Pattern of Life. But these are the three uh, main attributes of Father and Son for which we have been created in this image. Okay? And this has tremendous implications for how we read the Bible, uh, how we speak, how we operate in our marriages, how all the, the, just a few basic ones. 
the sanctuary in heaven operates on a divine pattern. Most holy place is the source, but you can't get to the source except through the channel of the holy place. Okay, it's a divine pattern. Holy place, most holy place. Operating, uh, you can get no other way into here except through. No man comes to the Father except through me. And what do we find in the holy place? The bread. I am the bread of life. We find the candlesticks. I am the light of the world. All this is operating Christ's ministry in the holy place for us to bring us to the Father. These are just some basic principles of the divine, what I call the divine pattern. Okay? Uh, and this, this opened up a whole lot of uh, amazing things uh, to my thinking. And I just wanted to mention that point to, to connect into this framework as we go along and as we talk about this. All right. Now I want to come to something that I find very exciting. <laughs> if this isn't exciting enough already. These two systems in terms of, uh, and we'll use the term design, design law and imposed law. Now, with the imposed law system, every time God speaks, it has an element of force in it, okay? In the design law, when you're operating in design law, because you are connected to him, everything he says is life. Every, every, every instruction he gives is life to you because you are dependent on him for everything. So in the garden, when God says about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... What did God say? In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now when God says those words, you shall surely die, in a design law system, what does that mean? It's just cause and effect. As, as people say, it's like gravity. You jump off a building, what's going to happen? You'll surely fall. You drop from a tall building, you will surely die. Onto concrete, onto... It's just, it's just, it's a warning in love, isn't it? Okay? But if you believe you have life in yourself, if you embrace that lie, you have life in yourself, and God says, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. How do you understand those words? I'm going to kill you. Yeah, I'm not dead yet, so... Uh, and this is what Satan's... This is what... When man embraced Satan's lie, it actually changed the meaning of God's word. It changed its meaning. So when they ate the fruit and they weren't dead, what was the only way that they were going to die? Well, the conclusion was that God was going to kill them. Got the mic, yellow. Now, hello. It's what Adam expressed when he hid in the garden. He was afraid that God was going to kill him. He even said, I'm afraid. Yeah, I was afraid. And why was he afraid? He was afraid. Leave that, lo that lie. It, it doesn't say in the text that anything about death, but he, he now is afraid of him, that something really bad is going to happen, that God is going to do something to him, which means that Adam has had an identity shift in how he understands God. This lie that you shall not surely die changes man's perception of the character of God as one who is arbitrary, who is tyrannical, controlling, dominating, and all of these things. All of this comes automatically from the lie, you shall not surely die. It's all inherent in that lie. And this is why we see in the book, A Great Controversy, page 562, uh, the, the foundation of the system, and maybe I should just read it uh, to you, because I've pondered this statement for many years. GC.
561.2. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. The foundation of his work was laid by the assurance given to Eve in the Eden, you shall not surely die. That's the foundation of his whole system is built on this lie, you shall not surely die. In the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. The masterpiece of deception is built on this lie, you shall not surely die. And so therefore, every, every teaching is connected to this lie. Every teaching of falsehood is built on this cornerstone of this lie, you shall not surely die. And what I'm attempting to do is to connect the points systematically. That by saying that you have life in yourself, you immediately make God's words and law imposed, forced, and tyrannical, being placed upon you. Okay? Uh, and how we understand the law and the way that it operates. Now, uh, just wondering where to go next with that. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about the design law. Sorry? Let's talk about the design law. Talk about the design law. In other words, when it's a delight to do the thing. Okay. So come to Psalms 119.97. It says, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. In the design system, the law of God is something that is life. Proverbs 13, 14, the law of the wise is a fountain of life. It's a fountain of life. Psalms 1, 1 to 3, it says uh, that he that, that, what does it say? I better read it. Can't remember it. It's after lunch. Can't remember. <laughs> You, you put that to song, Gary. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Okay? So now we want to, we want to understand something in terms of the concept of design law. Sin is the... Sin is the transgression of the law, okay? And the law is a transcript of what? So sin is the transgression of God's character. Did you, did you follow that through? Is that logic? Sin is to believe something about God that is not true and be, and, and be re unreconciled to the truth of who God is. Sin is a false belief of who God is and what he's like. That's sin. It's a transgression of the law. It's a lie. Okay? The implications of this are quite profound <laughs> to, in reference to how we view. And of course, by, by saying the lie, you shall not surely die, it shifted man and, and of course the evil angels that followed with Lucifer, that they moved across, suddenly it made God look like he was tyrannical, that he was forcing himself upon them. We have life in ourselves. We don't need you to tell us what to do. And that is sin. It is transgressing the way that God designed things and the way that he had set them up. And it caused man to rebel and resist on the belief that he has life within himself. Now, I, I, want to, uh, I want to show you one area where this is quite profound, but it'll take some time to unpack this. And now we do come to Matthew chapter 6, finally. <laughs> when, when, Jesus, when Jesus taught us to pray... 
What did he say? Chapter 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. What did he say? Our Father. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy character, thy name. He, we were told, we are told to address God as our Father. Okay? Now, when Satan shifted the universe, or as many as he could in the universe, over to this, God does know that, that when you eat of the fruit of the tree, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It placed within the human heart suspicion of God's intentions and motives towards us, that he was jealous for his own position, that he was trying to protect his position, which is the mind of Satan himself who's trying to protect his position. He's putting it onto God. For God does know in the day you eat thereof, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He's casting doubt on the character of God in this situation. But Christ is saying to pray, our Father. But Satan presents God as an unrelenting judge to judge and condemn and to point out the, and looking for the mistakes of people as a judge. But what did Jesus say about his Father? Have a look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse, we looked at this last night, but we're going to look at it again. Verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, and sorry, he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. The beautiful revelation of the Father. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. Christ says, I don't judge the one that doesn't listen to my words. I'm not judging him. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. How does this work? God, Christ has given us a witness of God's character and he's left that on record for us and what we do with that is what will judge us in the end. But he himself, he says, I judge not. Come over to John chapter 5. And we look at verse 22. For the Father judgeth how many people? Now you have to think about this for a minute. The Father judgeth no man. Your mind, if you have any kind of understanding of the scripture, your mind should be firing off texts like this saying, but what about Daniel 7? What about the thrones that were set in place? The books were open and the judgment was set. Doesn't that say that God is a judge? We just, this verse. We, just this. we just have to block this verse out because God is the great judge, the judge of all. But Jesus says, the Father judgeth no man. That's any man, righteous or unrighteous. Does that make sense? Well, what do we do with this? And this is what we talked about in the presentation this morning. Well, what are you going to do with this now? <laughs> Fear him. Fear him that is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Yeah. Okay? Because you need a little bit of fear. All right? So God says, Jesus says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. And what does the Son say? I'm not judging. 
the word, the, the word that I have spoken will be your judge. The witness that I have left behind, the testimony that I have given of my Father will judge you. This is different from examining and going through and looking and testing. Look at verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. That word condemnation is also translated judgment. He shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. What, what does this mean? <laughs> should be frying your circuits right now like but how does this fit i mean the central pillar of our faith is the declaration under 2300 days then shall a sanctuary be cleansed the most holy place the books are open and we're going through the records line by line line by line looking at every deed done and not done that should have been done the great judge of all the earth is judging everyone right It's the same principle. When Jesus said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house, it's the same principle. He was declaring that. He was declaring it, wasn't he? But didn't he have to wait for the judgment? Well, I don't think so. This is something we need to, we need to process and to understand in terms of the, the character of our Father. And I, I, I've jumped in and maybe I should do this in an afternoon session. How do we reconcile this statement? Well, have a look at Romans chapter 2, verse 16. Romans chapter 2 and verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel... What do you hear when you hear those words? Yeah. How does God judge the secrets of men? By Jesus Christ? Through his gospel. Through the revelation of the character of the Father, by revealing the loving character of God, this tests the hearts of all men as to whether they believe this witness or not. And then we come to Matthew 7, verse 2. Okay, Matthew 7, verse 2. Jesus says, judge not, because I'm the only one that can judge you. Is that what it says? Judge not, lest ye be judged. So who are the ones that are judged? The judges are the ones who are judged. Those who judge are judged. Interesting? When the Bible speaks of the judgment of God, it means that God is the one being judged. Okay, all right, you're on it. You're on it. So, verse 2, for with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged. Is it by hearing God's word that we are enabled to create this judgment in our heart and mind? God's word reveals the intent of our hearts, right? Yes. As, as you were saying before, Hebrews, Hebrews 4.12, right. the Word of God in this conflict and understanding God not judging and judging, it discerns the thoughts and intents of yeah. our heart mm -hmm. as to what we understand by this passage. Yeah. How is God judging? Jesus says, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Okay? And this is where... This is important to understand because the concept of a judge sitting on a tribunal looking over your life and imposing sentence upon you is imposed law. It's not design law. It's imposed law. The judge is imposing himself upon you. Okay? And that's why man sees God in this light. Man sees God as a judge relenting in his Minutia to find out every detail in your life. Oh, God. God's decision, 
Yeah, thank you, thank you. Design law, we are the ones who decide our own destiny. Impose law, God is the one who decides. Okay? What about Revelation 14, the hour of his judgment has come. I think uh, Joseph was speaking to this, the hour of his judgment. Whose judgment? Well, we often are taught that that's us being judged by him. Yeah. That is it we judging him. Yeah. We, we judge him and he accepts our judgment. Okay? And how does this judgment play out? Have a look at Matthew chapter 25. <laughs> yeah, Romans chapter 3. Let, every, let God be true and every man a liar, that you may overcome when you are judged. So, are you going to change the methodology at the um, investigative judgment, or are you going to throw it out? Change the methodology. There's going to be an investigative judgment. Yep. Has to be. On our part. Has to be. But well, aren't we in that now? We're in that investigative judgment. Aren't we learning about? Aren't we judging God now? Yeah. Okay. I, I want to unpack some of those, okay. those particular points. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25 in terms of how we understand the judgment. The, 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 man, the, the, the merchantman, of course, represents God in Matthew 25. And we have the man with one t talent. Uh, and we come down uh, and we look at verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. How did he come to this conclusion? He's judging God. He's judging the merchantman, which is representing God. He has passed judgment on God that God is hard. And what happens? Did you reap where thou hast not sown and gathered where thou hast not strawed? What evidence does he have for this? Zero. It is his own conception and his own judgment that he has passed upon God. And I was afraid. Oh, there's the voice of Adam. I was afraid. And went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. He's... His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Did the merchantman contradict the words? He didn't. He didn't contradict him. He simply mirrors back to him his own thinking. Okay? In the story in Luke, it says, Out of your own mouth I will judge you. Take him and cast him into outer darkness. Or in Luke it says, bring him and slay him before me. Now that's an interesting statement. That's an interesting statement. Okay? So, you got something? Well, two things. Number one, Jesus said, by your words shall you be justified, and by your words shall you be condemned. There was another thing when, when God asked Adam, where are you? Don't you think God knew where Adam was? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Adam, he, he was giving Adam a chance to exercise judgment on himself. So this, this is the great thing about the investigative judgment. We are active participants in this process. Okay? And it says, as you judge, you will be judged. The story of the talents tells you how this process works. The man who had five talents... And multiplied, based on his understanding and his love for his master, he multiplied it and turned it into ten talents. Okay? Maybe the reason why the man who had one talent only had one talent was because of his conception of the merchant. He was given according to his, his ability to receive. Because when you put it the other way, it sounds like, well, he only got one talent and that seems unfair. Well, why would God only give him one when he gave the other one five? That's not fair. He brought a short purse. He couldn't stuff any more money in the purse. I can only fit that much into your purse, so that I'll give you as much as you're willing to take from me. You see? This is a, a, a very different. You want to say something? Yeah, in verse 26, when it says, Thou knewest... In verse 26, when it says, Thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, when it's the word knewest... 
it, according to Strong, it means to see. So that was his point of view. Okay. It says. Okay, in the, in the it, Greek it says, you saw that yeah, I. Yeah, you saw. That was your, the way you saw things. So yeah. Okay. It said properly to see. Okay, in, to see. In, in the, in the you strong. saw it this way. You saw it this way, yeah. Okay. So, with that in mind, come to Psalms 18. Psalms 18. Look at verse 24. Or 25. With the merciful, thou will show thyself merciful. With the upright, thou will show thyself upright. With the pure, thou show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. Do we see how this works? As I judge, we will be judged. Why didn't Jesus say, when you pray, say, O oh, holy judge and holy and righteous judge? He said, say, our Father. Okay? This is, this is really important. So come to Daniel chapter 7. Let's have a look at this. This is... This is really important for us to understand. There is going to be a judgment. And what I want to suggest to you is this. By the time we get to 1844, the catalog, the catalog of human history in its interaction with God has been complete. And men then could run to and fro through the Bible, assessing the character of God and placing him upon trial as to what sort of person he is. And whatever verdict we would come to, will be the conclusion that is drawn and God will allow every man to have judgment according to his own desire. This is what is going to take place in the judgment. So the books have now been opened. Okay? It says, in, particularly in Daniel, that the, the sealed book was opened and we can begin to run to and fro through the books. The concept of God opening books and examining records is a reflection of what man is doing to God. Now, I want to share with you something really exciting. I was going to wait, but I've got to share it with you now because it's just really blowing me out of the water. So, uh, looking at Daniel, this is really exciting. Daniel chapter 7. Now, we want to start. Verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. So Daniel's having a vision. Now have a look, hold, hold that verse there and come and have a look at Numbers chapter 12 and verse 6. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 6. There's a difference in the word, yeah. Yep. Numbers 12, 6. Now the word, I think the word here... If someone's got Strong's with them, it could be Chazon. I don't think it's the Maria in this one, but someone might want to look that up for me. 12.6. And he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known to him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Now that word vision in the Hebrew is Mara, which means mirror. Okay? In a mirror. Got something there, Joseph? Yeah, there is, is something in Daniel 4 that even King Nebuchadnezzar, after Daniel revealed the dream, spoke and said, oh no, he said, you're God. He's a God of God and kings of... He judged God. He said, your God is the king of kings and, and okay, so God of gods. Okay, so he's passing judgment. Yes. Okay, there we have it again. So this word vision in Numbers 12, 6, its meaning is mirror. So every time there's a, a, a vision occurring, God makes himself known in a mirror. And it gets interesting. Now, this same word for vision in Numbers 12, 6, have a look at Exodus 38, 8. 38, 8. Same word. And he made the laver of, of brass and the foot of it 
brass of the looking glasses. That's the same word, Mara. The looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle. The laver was made out of looking glasses called Mara, which is exactly the same word as vision. So what am I saying? <laughs> that when Daniel had a vision, it's in a mirror. It's coming through man's understanding of what is taking place. He makes himself known in a vision, in a mirror. So this vision that Daniel has is actually expressing man's understanding of what God is doing. It's coming through a vision. You, do you see the implication of this? That this is our perception of what he is doing in the judgment. Okay? He's doing something. But He's doing something, but this is through the mirror. This is what we are understanding that he is doing. Okay? Now, what does it say? And I've just, just had a thought come to me right then. In Daniel, it says, A fiery stream issued from before him. Okay? 10,000 ministered unto him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Now look at Exodus 24, verse 17. You get a similar fire going on here. Exodus 24, verse 17. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mountain. Where? In the eyes of the children of Israel. This is how they perceived the glory of the Lord. Their understanding of this was that it was devouring fire. It was there to kill and to destroy them. Because they're under the concept of imposed character, imposed law. Their perception, I knew you that you were a hard man reaping where you do not sow. And so what Daniel sees in vision is in a, it's in a, it's a vision of the night this is another important point. He sees this picture of God, okay, sitting and doing these things. God is sitting. There is a judgment taking place, but it's coming through a vision of man's comprehension and man's understanding. Does that make sense? Maybe. <laughs> I've got more on this. He gave the judgment. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you picked up on that because I was reading that the other day and I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if that's what that means. He gave the judgment to the saints. They have the right judgment. So he yielded the judgment. It's his judgment. And he said, the saints have my character correctly. They've worked it out. They've assessed my character correctly. And that is the dominion. Christ has given a dominion and a kingdom and the dominion and the kingdom are those who judge the character of God correctly. That becomes the dominion and the kingdom and the glory, which is character. You see? So, okay. Are you, are you beginning to see something interesting here? <laughs> In terms of, this is so beautiful. Because how do you harmonize the statement of Jesus? My Father judges no man. Could you believe it? The central pillar of Adventist faith completely screwed up and twisted and totally misunderstood. Well, there was a voice in the wilderness that was crying out saying it's the judgment of God that's taking place. Can you not take this application to heaven and see that the angels had to decide and judge God? Yeah. The angels. Yeah. They all That's had to decide. That's powerful. Isn't it powerful? Yes, it is. Very powerful. Now let me show you something in Daniel chapter 10 because it's really, this is where it really gets interesting and I, I'm, I'm breaking into a number of different presentations but it's okay. As Jim has lamented several times, I'm always meshing presentations and making it hard. So... Another angle, you see a living stream that gets larger. 
Yeah. Yeah. When, when, when God spoke and said, this is my son, hear him, what did the people hear? Thunder. But it was a, it was a, it was a still small voice of our father. And it was like thunder. Amazing. You've got, you've got something there? There's one in John 9 that's a little puzzling, and maybe we can try to look at it for a second. John 9, 39. Okay. What Jesus you said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Could you kind of explain that a little bit? <laughs> For judgment I came to this world. As we read in Romans 2.16, God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Yes. So when he comes into the world and he reveals the character of God, his revelation of the character of God revealed their characters. So when in Hebrews 1, God committed all things to the Son, he committed judgment as well as everything else he committed to him. And the reason why the judgment is committed to the Son is because the Son is the one revealing the character of the Father. Absolutely. He's the visible. He's, he can be seen. Yeah. Yeah. So the father has put his whole character in the hands of his son. And, and we judge the character of the son. And the verdict of what we see in the son is how we, observe, how we judge the character of the father. And whatever we judge... God ensures that every one of us will receive the judgment that we have believed in. And the investigative judgment that is going on is as we are going through, and I can tell you, as I'm studying this particular question, and I'm seeing God's character, it is testing at the intents and thoughts of my heart. It is going through layer. I'm being searched with candles, as it says in Zephaniah. It's going through me. Every detail is going through and testing my character against this character that I'm seeing that is like Jesus. That's an investigative judgment because it's testing me. Love your enemies. Do good to them who persecute you. This is testing us. This is the investigation that is taking place. And it is a complete reversal of what we have understood. God doesn't need to investigate anything. He, he knows it. And we've had this dilemma. What does God need to investigate? What does he need to investigate when he already knows everything? This is the great dilemma we've had with the judgment, in understanding the judgment. But make no mistake... The judgment has been set. The whole date, 1844, October 22nd, 1840. It's all legitimate. It's just we've understood it under an imposed law system. Old covenant. Okay? In the old covenant, going into the most holy place under the old covenant is death. It's tremendously fearful. This is, this is the challenge. But the very foundation of Adventist faith has become a millstone around the neck of its believers and will crush many. Uh, the evangelical part of the church tried to escape this doctrine by simply throwing it out and getting rid of 1844 and throwing all those things out. No, that's not the way out. That's the wrong way to go about it. There is a judgment. There definitely is a judgment. But it's the, how it plays out is completely different from what we've understood. Why? Because my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways. Now come to Daniel chapter 10. Oh, I shouldn't go this long this after afternoon. Sorry, Daniel chapter 10. Are you, are, you, are you waking up now? I'm getting excited. Now notice, it says, Verse 5, 10, 5, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen. Who is that? It's Jesus. Whose loins were girded with fine gold. The Son of God. So his loins are fine gold. Gold is a, a representation of purity of character, a correct interpretation and understanding of character is gold. But what does he, else does he notice? His body was like beryl and his face is the appearance of lightning. 
his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet in the colour of polished brass. In this vision, in this vision of the night, the feet and the arms of Jesus are in the colour of brass, which means there is a perception of his actions that are not seen correctly. His actions and his movements are not understood correctly. Does, does that make sense? Because it's part of the mirror. It's part of this mirror conception. Now, we need to look at a few more verses uh, in Scripture. Um, Job 37, 18 tells you something interesting. And I've, I've covered this in the presentation, The Brass Mirror. But Job 37, 18... Elihu is speaking and he's instructing his instructors as a young man uh, and 18, 37, 18. How hast thou with him spread out the sky which is strong and as a molten looking glass? Molten is metal and the modern translations say brass, a brass mirror. See, he says God has set out the sky like a brass mirror. When does the sky become brass? Well, it says in Deuteronomy 28, 23, that when you break my commandments and my statutes and my judgments, the heavens become brass. Okay? And if it's a brass mirror, and you look up into the heavens, what do you see? You see yourself. Okay? Okay? You see yourself. You think you're seeing God, but you're actually seeing yourself. And this is exactly what James says in James 1.23. Oh, I'm right there. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. James 1.23. And this is what we're seeing in the, in the vision of Daniel. Daniel in the season of the night, in the vision, in the mirror of the night, God's actions are perceived and understood by man as a, as a meticulous judge. But you're getting excited, Daniel. Meticulous judge. But God, as it says, we've got to take the words of Jesus, the Father judgeth no man. Who are you going to believe? But the thing is, if the Father judgeth no man... That immediately condemns all of us, doesn't it? Because how many people have we judged? How many people have we sat in the judgment seat and condemned them and sentenced them to disfellowship from our presence? The, the, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. Two verses in Matthew 5 you might want to look at. Yeah. Verse 21 and 22. Thank you. Matthew 5, yeah. You've heard that it has been said of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Okay? Judgment, the spirit to judge. The whole concept of judgment and the prosecutor, the accuser, this whole concept of justice, and we're going to spend some time and then maybe we'll look at this tonight. The counterfeit system of justice which Satan instituted and brought into the universe. Our Father judges no one. Just let that sink in. What does that do to your conception? He judges no one. But he lets everyone have his judgment according to his own understanding. And God is not mocked, because as a man sows, so shall he also reap. God's ways are, are, are so fair. And the way that this judgment plays out is so reverse of what I've previously understood and thought, how does this operate in a design law principle, the design law principle of judgment? It is not God imposing himself upon you as a relentless judge, going through every last detail of your life. Because isn't that what we do to the people that have hurt us? 
we hang on, we remember the last details of all the things that they have done to us. And we accuse them. Judge not, because our Father doesn't judge. He doesn't judge. I mean, this is good news. <laughs> this is incredibly good news. But the key is to understanding that what Daniel saw was a vision of the night. It was in the mirror. It was a reflection. And we need to understand, but why did God allow this to be played out like this? Why does he allow this vision to be showing him a picture of himself as a judge that is with imposing stature and fire and all of these things? Why does he allow this to be shown to us? You going to say something? All right. We need to go to the covenants. We need to understand how the covenants play out. The conception of judgment. How we understand God's judgment and our judgment. Judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. These are the things that I've been wrestling with as I've been looking at these passages. Now, you want to come back to Matthew 5. You've heard that it has been said of old, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Yeah. We, we who see through the glass darkly don't dare condemn someone else. We should, should never because we don't know their circumstances. We don't know the challenges that they are going through. To pass judgment on them is, is going to lead to a lot of problems. But nowadays we just judge your perceived doctrine. I mean, not you, but I mean you as the, uh, the universal. We judge the doctrine and your doctrine. That's a incrossable line. So yeah, yeah. And in suggesting what I'm suggesting today, I've, I've stood on many, many toes and I've probably angered a lot, a lot of people because people want judgment. They want people to get it in the neck. They want people to get it because if they don't, then I have to love them. If I know they're going to get judgment, they're going to burn in hell. I just have to wait till they burn in hell. I don't have to love them. So you're going to get it in the end. God's going to get you. But if you have to love your enemies, <laughs> you've got to give all that up. You've got to truly love them. So this for me is some of the implications of the difference between the design law and the imposed law. And it changes everything around and how we understand the judgment and how things are all playing out. As you judge, you will be judged. For with what judgment you judge, it will come back to you. And this is another angle on this that is important. When Jesus says, judge not, if we are Christians, whose spirit is it that dwells within us? Christ's, a spirit that doesn't judge. I mean, doesn't that work? So we're not... So, anyway, we better finish there. It's 4.30. <laughs> I just want to put some thoughts out there. We'll come back tonight and we'll look at the, uh, the atonement and the uh, demand of justice. We need to look at the demands of justice. Yeah. I just want to quote somebody. <laughs> I just love this quote. The knowledge that my father does not condemn me takes the power of sin away and the joy of service to our Savior is a complete delight. There, do you recognize that? Do, do I recognize that? That quote? Mm -hmm. Maybe. It's yours. <laughs> I wrote that, did I? <laughs> Amen. It's perfect. There is therefore, <laughs> there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. No condemnation. He that is in Christ is a new creation. This is, 
This is such a revolution in understanding. So, the sorry. No, no condemnation. No judgment. No judgment. There is no judgment because the Father judges no man. The final quote on this that I want to leave with you that tr triggered me onto this idea, and I, I, I guess I better just read you the quote because um, it, it, its its implications are big and it'll work into our next presentation. Uh, hope I can remember how to spell it. Okay. Yes. Testimonies to Ministers, page 245. Just listen carefully to this. Must he give up the people for whom such a provision had been made, even his only begotten son, the express image of himself? God permits his son to be de delivered up for our offences. He himself assumes toward the sin bearer the character of a judge. Why is he assuming the character of it. Why doesn't it just say God is the judge? He's assuming towards the sin bearer the character of a judge, divesting himself of the endearing qualities of a father. That's so beautiful because what he's doing is he's giving the people what they want. He's giving people what they want. He's the them only they are. way that we would believe that God would forgive us is to manifest the relentless, overbearing, tyrannical nature of a judge and wreak vengeance on his son. And this is the only way that our minds could be open to a belief that God would forgive us. That's why we had to put Christ on the cross. Yeah. It's like meeting us where we are. It's what we do with our children. Meeting us where we are. <laughs> and this is what we see in Daniel 7. God is meeting us. Where we are, he assumes towards the, the sinner the character of a judge in order to bring him to Christ. All right, we better finish. <laughs> There's a lot more. Sorry? Yeah, why? Why? <laughs> it's just getting good. <laughs> well, we've been going 90 minutes and... Uh, it feels like a new movement. Huh? It feels like a new movement. Oh, does it? Well, we can go to questions if you want to keep going. <laughs> I just don't want our thought process to get interrupted. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think I think you need to process some of the things that we're saying here and look up the words judgment. You need to go back and read Facing Life's record and go over the concepts of judgment and just, you know, just test this principle. Test the principle. But always remember the words of Jesus. The Father judges no man. You know, this is really important. Yeah. This is so new. It's new to me, Dennis. It's new to me. But in my excitement, I can't help but share it with my friends. Because I know you won't condemn me and throw things at me. So. <laughs> my son's excited. <laughs> I just, I mean, sorry? Yeah, it's time. I've been, pondering, I've been pondering this for a number of days now. That, well, will I share it? Will I share it? Oh, I've got to share it. I've got to share it with you. Putting all these pieces... Uh, together, but it fits perfectly with this imposed law, this imposing judge. If he assumes toward the sin bearer the character of a judge, that means he's not a judge, which is perfectly consistent with what Jesus is saying in the New Testament. We have understood him to be in this character through the visions of the night, through the glory of what we understand. And so, why, and I, need, I didn't get to this in Romans chapter 5, why does God allow himself to be portrayed this way? Moreover, the law entered to cause sin to abound. Our conception of God is made to abound, that the offense might abound. Our view of him is made to abound, that where sin abounds, grace, grace does much more abound. The fear of the relentless judge drives us to Christ. And when we find Christ, we actually find that the Father is not who we thought he was. So he allows us to have our conception, our false conceptions of this great judge. And maybe this is one of the reasons that the Adventism is amongst 
the most critical people on earth because they worship a relentless judge who goes through every record and looks at studies. And that's why in our communities this, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? Condemn, condemnation, condemnation because we worship a God of condemnation. That's why I love Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason, reason together. together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if what I'm saying is true, we're all in trouble. We're going to stop condemning other people because our Father doesn't do it. We could use our minds for other things. Yeah. We can be freed from worrying about all the silly and foolish things that people do to us and become like our Father. It's exciting, isn't it, Daniel? Time to dance, isn't it? <laughs> All right, let's have a prayer. <laughs> Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share on this subject uh, of you as a judge and how we have understood this. And Father, I pray that we will study these things out line by line, precept by precept, to see whether these things are actually sh uh, true we need to take the time to look at these things. But in the design law system versus the imposed law system, truly, you are our Father. And you are never divested of your endearing qualities. You do not deny yourself. But you allow yourself to see us this way in order that we may brought, be brought to Christ and that we may see the truth of your character. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.